Hey, Jack, welcome to Light Reading. Thanks for having me. How, how are things at level three? Things are great. Today was our earnings day, so uh, we had a great uh, 2015 and off to a good 2016, so we're excited. I guess one of the things which I'm excited to talk to you about is um, the relationship that you have with some of the big players in the content space. You've made some interesting partnerships there. You, it's almost like you're looking to go out of your way to embrace those relationships uh, and doing some real high volume uh, connections. How would you define uh, your relationship with those web scale players? Yeah, I mean, without getting into any real specific customers, they're a great group of customers. Right. They bring high demand, take advantage of our scale. What's really interesting is that they are folks that buy a lot of different things from us, whether it's infrastructure, fiber, data center colocation space, all the way to CDN and high-speed IP yeah. transit, wavelength services. We're seeing great demand kind of across all services from that, that group of customers. Do you ever wonder that they're just going to want to build it all themselves? And Because they're doing a bit of that in the data center right now, aren't they? I think if we only had one set of, of products, then we'd probably worry. Right. Um, but but when, when you say they're going to build it all themselves, they they'll can't. probably come to us to actually get <laughs> the piece parts to build it. And, and that's, that's a great position for us. I mean, what do you think the future holds, uh, you know, five or even ten years out, if I can ask you to, to think about that that far. I mean, there are people who are saying, you know, uh, OTT and web scale companies are going to become the new tier one carriers. I mean, do you, do you think that that's, uh, I mean, how is the competitive environment going to shift in that time? I, I think those, that class of, of customers are real focused on their core business and what we do is a necessary part of what they do. Mm. And I don't think that will change. Right. Um, I think their business models will evolve over time. Um, certainly what's happening out to the rest of the ecosystem, if you were a, a traditional media company, you might feel where they're headed a little bit more than, than where a level three is. But, but we, like, we like the fact that we're able to serve their needs and I think we'll be able to serve their yeah. needs for, for a long, long time. And this is your speciality and they have their specialities, which I guess if you're Amazon, it's now selling books in bricks and mortar things. I mean, they seem to be going backwards. What's going to be next? Like some sort of telegraph service or carrier pigeons? Who Hard knows? to say. I mean, when we started, when we started, we, we put 12 plastic pipes in the ground and uh, um, filled up one of them with a cable. Yeah. And now, you know, as, as we progress and, and fiber technology changes and our demands change, we have a lot of optionality in, in the basic assets that we built and bought over right. the last last 18 years. Yeah. What's your take on uh, virtualization? I mean, it's obviously a technology, particularly NFV, that people have been just absolutely fixated with. I, it probably accounts for 75% of the content coming out of light reading and heavy reading at the moment. Where's level three in the in its virtualization journey? First off, I'd say it, it has a lot of hype. So uh, you're welcome. So, yeah, yeah, you guys are doing yeah, a great job. Thank you. Yeah. Um, as far as virtualization itself, it's not necessarily a new idea. No. It's been around for decades. Right. Uh, what, what's interesting is that white box hardware has become performant enough to take on functions that otherwise were, had to be in bespoke hardware. And, and that's really what has changed. Mm. What I think is kind of interesting and where we'll see how things head is, well, can you take a general purpose machine virtualize a function and does it make economic sense for that end good to the customer. There are lots of benefits along the way. There's, right. there's service chaining, there's, there's agility, I can right. turn something on and off. Um, but we need to really prove out the economic model uh, well, a little more. Let's think that through. If you're, which you are, responsible for rolling out new technology and you say to you know, the board of level three, well, I'm going to do this, uh, you know, they want to know what the end goal is and saying, oh, you know, I've made the network more agile when, when you're on the way to, to that end point. If the end point is an economic benefit, isn't really going to help you, right? So does that mean that, uh, I mean, and I imagine, you know, um, you would, your position would be representative of an awful lot of service providers. So it sounds like there, there needs to be some work done on the economics. There, there, there does, but, but if you take a step back and think that the, the VNF, Mm. world 
um, could be a PNF world, a physical network function or a virtualized network function, then all of the work that you do to bring that function to the interior of the network rather sitting out at a customer premise, a lot of that works the same. Mm. And so the economic model that I'm suggesting is one that is, well, does the PNF or VNF, which makes sense, right. um, we still think there's huge advantage of pulling that function to the interior of our network for, for things like scale and agility and all right. those other things. So there's an immediate benefit to that part of it. Absolutely, and yeah. some of the hard work, the plumbing work, yeah. the service chaining itself, yeah. and the, the architecture to actually do that is, is uh, something that we'll do no matter what. Right, and, and have you virtualized parts of your core network net yet? The, the core network itself, I'd say, is probably not a place where I would, uh, we'll, we'll spend any time in at least the, the near future worrying about. You don't want to just roll it out there, see, if it, you know, <laughs> see how it goes, Pro you know, roll the dice? Well, I think, I think where we will is for those edge functions that yeah. make a lot of sense. When you say core network, I yeah. think of the thing that does 100 million packets per yeah. second yeah. and has 18 to 20 terabytes or terabits of, of uh, forwarding yeah. capacity. That's probably not something we're going to virtualize anytime right. soon. I mean, you, you have uh, created uh, a strong reputation in managed security services. Is that a mark? Is that a type of service that you would be looking to virtualize? It, it is, and that's really the first place where we are, are looking okay. and, and actually deploying is, if you looked at our DDoS service itself, it, it, is, it has some bespoke hardware, it has some, some virtualized hardware in the solution itself. Mm. Um, it's a great place, it's, it's a need right now. Mm. And, and as you think about why is security so important, I, uh, I think it's because of the whole cloud trend. Right. And, and three, three or four years ago, an enterprise CIO would say, I'm, I'm really worried about public infrastructure. Uh -huh. And that's a, a generic, public infrastructure statement, whether it was server, storage, or even network. Yeah. Today, enterprise CIOs are getting over that really that hesitation really quickly and looking to public infrastructure, whether it's networking or whether it's compute, storage, whatever. And and with that comes a lot of security concern. Right, right. And so yeah, that's a super interest for us, super interest to to do the trade between physical hardware and virtual virtualizing some functions. Well, uh, two, two questions there, but let's stay on security if we can for a second. How, how do you keep up with all of the security threats that face your network and your customers' traffic over your network? I mean, how on earth do you do that? I knock on wood a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, we, we've been at this for, for nearly 18 years, and, and we've had a security function mm -hmm. in our company since the very, very beginning. And, and we got really good at protecting our infrastructure. And, and I, I don't say that lightly, and I worry about it every day, yeah. but, but we, we yeah. have focused on protecting our infrastructure. And we built a great physical and logical capability uh, along the way. Right. So we built this great physical and logical capability that, that we've been able to turn towards security offerings. When you think about the network that we have, we, we have a great perspective of the internet and of lots of other private networks. We're able to take that situational awareness landscape that we're able to see, apply it to security services that like DDoS services mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, threat analytics is the is one of the other latest buzzwords, and I, I think that that we have a great. Um, a great offering today and one that will expand its capability in the in the coming months and, and years. Do markets like or, or applications and needs like security or even for that matter virtualization um, prompt level three to look at smaller startup providers for their solutions as well as the massive incumbents you know like Cisco, CERN, and, and Nokia. I mean, they're just getting bigger and bigger, aren't they? You mm -hmm. know? Uh, do mm -hmm. you still look down further down the supply chain to smaller suppliers to we, see what's going on there? Absolutely, absolutely. Whether it's just a, a not just, but, but a hardware supplier or someone that's providing software. We've done some capability acquisitions. We bought a company uh, mid last year called Black Lotus that, that helped us uh, progress our security offerings. So absolutely, we look to both small and large companies. And, and 
what you've seen in the security space is, is in some ways it's a fairly nascent industry where where more and more technology investment from from VCs is going and therefore there's a lot of attention and a lot of great development that's happened. So I think, uh, you know, we're not partial to just buying from the big guys and, and Is that frankly, a philosophy on your part or the company's part, both? Uh, I'd, I'd say both. I think, I think the company has always been very supportive in our decisions around who we buy from, wh how we buy, what we buy. Um, we uh, at times have bought, have bought from uh, small little startups that turned into great big companies. Sure. And uh, at the time it was pretty early on and, and, uh, and something that was, that was uh, perhaps uh, more difficult. How much of your time do you spend talking to suppliers versus customers, Jack? Uh, I'd say I spend more than half of my time talking to customers. Yeah. Uh, and and you know I, I think our customers tell us kind of where we need to head. They give us a great perspective. Um, what do you think is keeping them awake at night right now? <laughs> I think security keeps yeah. them awake at night. And that would be true of both government and enterprise. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you know I, I think it's because of this shift to acceptance of more public infrastructure. Yeah. Public where cloud, public yeah. cloud, public networking, yeah. and so yeah, I think that that's what keeps them up at night. The second thing I'd say is around scale. Right. And scale is something that you know some companies can accommodate. I think we do a pretty good job. Do you of, mean capacity, or do you mean more than that? It's capacity. It's operating scale. It's operating leverage. The ability to turn up lots and lots of services along the way. I think it's everything from just you know turning up turning up 100 gig links mm. on a backbone or in a metro network as well as construction as mm. well as uh, people that actually turn up services so no I think scale is a very broad uh, description of what we do. There's been an interesting um, debate going on recently about whether the five nines metric is still valid for service providers who are trying to be innovative and you know take on a DevOps model and mm -hmm. fail fast and uh, you know, by the way, I'd love, a, I'd love to run a business where people were encouraging me to fail fast. It seems like a fantastic <laughs> opportunity for someone like me. But, I mean, is Five9 still how you run your business? And what about your carrier customers and service provider customers? What are they asking you for? I, I mean, customers care about availability. There's no doubt, no question. Um, but they also care about cost and about value. Right. And, and those, are, those are things that, that are trades, frankly. Right. Uh, in, in the underlying economics. So I think customers are willing and are willing to consider different levels of, of quality um, for different services. And yeah, I think it's something that we talk about all the time. Yeah. You know, if we only ever bought carrier class routers and switches, there wouldn't be some of the, the companies that we know of today because they didn't start out as carrier class. They became carrier class over time and, and therefore, you know, you have to be with them along the evolution. Right. The the internet. Uh, back when I got involved in in the internet in the, in the late eighties, yeah. oh, way before that. Oh, where were you? Uh, I was I was at a small government lab in the late eighties okay. uh, at the National Cancer Institute of all okay. places. Um, but it was one of the first sites on on what what today is the public internet. The availability was horrible back yeah. then, yeah. but. But the improvement curve was right. so amazing yeah. that that you could see over time that that the improvement would be there. And today, you know, we used to hold up the voice network as yeah. the thing that had, had all the availability and and, uh, and quality. And frankly, yeah. today, the uh, availability and quality of even the public internet has yeah. far, surpa far surpassed even Absolutely. some of the traditional uh, technologies that we use today. Yeah. What do you think about the whole open source? Well, I mean, I guess I was going to call it a revolution. I'm not sure it really is a revolution, though. I mean, is it very important to level three uh, to uh, buy products which have um, been developed, you know, through the system of open source specifications and recommendations? I mean, we talked about hype earlier. 
Uh, I mean, where, where is uh, open source on the hype scale for service providers today? I, I think it's a reality. Yeah. I really do. I think that, um, and you know, I don't view the open source community as something that just happened last last. Absolutely. Yeah. And even in the last five years, I would argue yeah. that it's been around from the GNU days and 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 way back then. And, they do and have so the good names, don't they? They, yeah. they do have the good names, yeah. and and so no, I think it's incredibly important to us and more broadly to the technology industry mm -hmm. um, and, and the, the amount of, of innovation that's happened in the open source community has mm -hmm. been spectacular. For us, it's a tool in our toolkit. We don't right. do everything open source, but we try to, to leverage where we can. Does open source mean interoperable? Because it seems <laughs> like a lot of people thought it would do, particularly around the virtualization technology, but that's really not the case as it turns out. I mean, do you think there's a misconception about that? Pro probably a little bit, but it certainly is better than not open Absolutely. source. And so it's a good head start is the way I, I would view it. Yeah. Can you explain the Bitmile stuff to me? You reached this agreement with Google, which um, kind of sailed over my head a little bit. Tell me about that. Sure, and I, I'll, I'll stay away from the customer and, sure, and yeah. talk more so about my level, about my level what, interconnection. What interconnection stuff. is, and you yeah. know, interconnection itself has been around. Um, uh, not to give a history lesson, but back no. to the Kingsbury commitment and AT and T when. In the, in the early 1900s and, yeah. and the requirement of interconnection, the railroads had to interconnect, all kinds. So interconnection isn't necessarily something new. Right. Um, what, what has happened in the, in the last 20 years of internet development is, is the desire of two networks to interconnect and how they do it in a fair and equitable, equitable way. And there are tons of different ways to do this. Mm. Um, we happen to like this notion of bit mile which really measures the amount of traffic and distance that a provider or a network carries and tries to, between the two parties, make them equivalent. Hmm. So I may, I may carry lots of stuff on my backbone and uh, I do that because I'm trying to hand off that traffic closer and closer to the customer edge. And, hmm. and if I do that between two networks I, and I get some sort of balance, it, it's a bit of a proxy for the investment that we're both making to, to make sure that it's fair and equitable. Um, we have a few agreements that we've talked about publicly, mm. uh, one that you mentioned, mm. as well as we have many that, that aren't publicly uh, uh, disclosed. It's one way of coming up with a fair and equitable uh, interconnection agreement. I think there are probably others, we have others for sure. Will it work in Europe or bit kilometer there, I suppose? <laughs> bit kilometer will work in Europe yeah. um, and, and we, we hope that that that's that enough. continues to evolve too there. Okay. All right, that was helpful. I'm going to ask you a few technology questions, if I may. Sure. Uh, actually, if you can apply the technology to g give your business spin on it, that would be even better. 4K video, is that a problem or an opportunity for Level 3? Uh, from, from a consumer well, yeah, basis, it's, it's awesome. Yeah. Um, I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. I think the, the, the problem, and especially for level three, um, you know, for, for those that serve the end, the last mile of the consumer, it's probably more of a problem. And, right. and so, you know, I, I don't, and I don't mean to make light of it because I think it, it is one that, that requires, you know, some change in architecture, some change in technology. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, it's more bits. Um, it's more bits per video session. It's yeah. higher quality. You know, not not to go back too it's far. It's a driver. It's a driver yeah. for your business. In 1998, yeah. we argued, as an industry and as a company starting mm -hmm. up, whether we could carry a phone call yeah. over IP technology. Yeah. And today, we're starting to carry UHD 4K know, over the it? top. Yeah. And so, I would offer that it's just another milestone. Yeah. Uh, greater quality, more bits, and for us, great because. We like more bits. Yeah, I mean, as a as a publisher of multimedia information, the volume of video downloads on our site has quintupled in eighteen months. So five times as much video. And if we ran your interview today, Jack, um, as a text article, it would get about two and a half thousand downloads in the first week. On video, it'll get well. Actually, yours will probably get a lot more than that. But I mean, it'll get a, a factor of four more if we run it as a video. So. You know, we kind of see that every day on the site. And I suspect, and I was talking to Huawei last week in Shenzhen, and they, they really appear to be staking the future of their company on 
video being the killer application. And I think there may be something to that, actually. I mean, I, we all know it's going to be incredibly important, but I, I sometimes wonder whether people aren't sort of missing the really obvious killer app for the networks which we're building in the 21st century. I mean, you can't get enough video, right? I, I think that's absolutely right. And when you think about the, the, the buzz where I'm going to beat you to one, uh, Internet of Things, yeah. um, more devices. Yeah. Well, what do those devices do? Are they just sensors? Maybe. No. Yeah. Well, some Maybe. Of them. But if they that's all one, are that's one internet. If of they things. all are yeah. things that have some part of video collection or distribution, yeah. that gets pretty exciting. Yeah. And and I do think video as a category mm -hmm. is the killer app. Mm -hmm. But how it's actually used and which applications use it and all that, we we're just at the beginning. Yeah. I mean that that's really true and that's true of all of the big technology application trends nobody really sees them until they uh, nobody sees them coming until they get here really let's talk about another big technology um, shift which uh, is is coming our way uh, 5g anybody talking about 5g with you yet i mean what's uh, what, so, you know because originally it was supposed to be 2020 now zt and huawei have got pre-standard 5G stuff out, you know, you put in a, a pre-standard 5G massive MIMO antenna and you get four times the performance on a regular 4G phone. It's pretty exciting. It, it's very exciting. Again, I do believe that it's yet another milestone of end devices, wireless technology. We, we aren't a, yeah. a, an owner of Spectrum, um, but the implication for us is probably more more building of the periphery yeah. of our network to, to aggregators of wireless traffic um, and that wireless traffic having more and more demands on, yeah. on networking. Well, let's, let's bring it in to, to a space where you are very uh, dominant. Uh, you know, let's talk about optical. Any interesting optical breakthroughs yeah. coming? Yeah. Well, there was one that came, which is one that, that it will be around us for a while, and that, that's this whole coherent detection and higher level modulation. What's that all about? It, it, it's, well, you know, before in, in, in the early 2000s, the mm -hmm. greatest advancement of, of lasers was turning them on and off. Okay. And uh, eventually, <laughs> eventually you ran out of how quickly you could turn them on and off and how quickly you could detect it. Yeah. And then along came this technology, which frankly came from radio. Yeah. Um, a higher modulation scheme, whether it's BPSK, QPSK, QAM, all, all different types of modulation. And then um, coherent detection, the ability to detect in a, in a better way than, than just seeing the light turn on and off. Right. And that all added together has really made this jump to higher and higher uh, bandwidth on fiber, different fiber types being more, uh, more advantageous to more bandwidth on the fiber. Right. It, it really is an exciting time in optics right now. So the, bottle, uh, the optical network isn't going to be the bottleneck? Because the bottleneck keeps on jumping around, right? It's like a gopher. You know, it's either in the system or the handheld device or the software or you know, and at some various points it has been in the core, but it doesn't sound like it's going to be in the core for a while. Well, I'd say it's good to have options, right? Mm. And so you know, if, you only had, uh, if you only have one pair of fibers, yeah. That's probably a bottleneck, yeah, depending yeah, yeah, on your yeah. demand and what your application yeah. is. So it's probably good to have some optionality around the number of fibers or the fiber type yeah. you have or the fiber type you might be able to have. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I, for us, I don't see it as an impediment. It's an opportunity. Right. And we have a lot of optionality up and down our physical network. Do you think that's the most exciting thing happening in technology right now? Do you think optical is more important than, or more exciting uh, in and of itself? Not speaking for level three, but for you personally as a technology zealot, uh, is it more exciting than the virtualization stuff or are they just different? I just think they're different yeah. and you know I, I'm, uh, I'm an internet guy, mm -hmm. I've spent most of my career around the internet, the, 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 probably the most exciting and satisfying thing that I see is, is the fact that IP technology, 20 years ago there was a big debate, there is no debate at all no. around IP technology and its importance to communications and yeah. that's that's no matter which layer of the network you're in, that's no matter whether you're a wireless provider or a wireline provider or a yeah. satellite provider, it doesn't matter. Right. And, and that technology, that's the exciting part to me, and it's something that, that I think many people have spent their, their lives working on. You know, uh, just a closing thought, if you will, Jack. It, 
you know, I've been doing this for a long time, as we both have. I, I haven't seen anything like this um, uh, set of circumstances which we see in the communications industry right now, where you have multiple disruptive technologies and multiple new competitive forces coming into the market all at the same time. Because I mean, it's not like the shift from fixed to mobile or packet to, or circuit switch to, to packet data. It's like all of those things happening at once with a bunch of new massive companies all charging into the middle. It feels unprecedented to me and, and, and really exciting. I mean, is that... Do you think I'm right? Is this unprecedented right now? I, I don't know if I'd say unprecedented. I'd say it's exciting. Yeah. And so, you know, I uh, I'm continue to be the optimist around technology. I've never, ever believed in my whole career that we're going to hit the end. Right, um, right. And, and right. so Absolutely. many technology folks, I think, believe that at times. I think uh, that that there's yeah. always another way, and and no, whether mean, it's absolutely. Shannon's law or, yeah. or anything else, we uh, will always find a way, and that's why I'm excited. It's it's really a, a you know a privilege to have you come to the light reading headquarters today. I've been dying to meet you. I mean, I got through you know a fraction of the huge. <laughs> I asked the staff for uh, questions, and they sent me you know over a hundred questions to ask you. So we got through some of them today. It's a real pleasure. Uh, you know, I hope we can stay in touch and thanks so much for, for doing the interview today, Jack. Thanks so much for having me. Cheers. Nice to meet you.